you know, all of us know we're seeing an increase in the level of rodents. Uh, we need to zero in. I had a a device that was called Rat Trap. Uh, it was an amazing device. We're going to see about deploying those rat traps throughout the city, particularly in high areas where rodents is a serious problem. New York's incoming mayor, Eric Adams, has been crusading against rats for a long time. I remember the rat trap he's talking about because he unveiled it at a press conference and it was essentially a bucket where the rat is lured to its death by drowning in some sort of mysterious <laughs> vinegar concoction. The Times referred to it literally as a ghastly spectacle with a stomach churning <laughs> odor in a piece headlined, Rats have ruled New York for 355 years. Can a mystery bucket stop them? Well, no one said it was going to be pretty, <laughs> but I think Eric Adams right now must be feeling like, you know, he had an idea whose time has come because almost as soon as the pandemic started in 2020, newspapers began to run stories about how rats in the absence of humans are going to take over. I'm going to read you some headlines from the last year. This is April 2020, one month into the pandemic in the U.S., Starving, angry, and cannibalistic, America's rats are getting desperate amid coronavirus pandemic. And then the next month we have, aggressive rats may increase during pandemic, CDC says. <laughs> and a great video from Fox titled, Rats Growing Aggressive Even Eating Each Other During the Pandemic. I guess the involvement of the CDC, which I was not aware rats were within their purview, but that suggests that this is not just a New York City problem. This is a nationwide problem that just affects cities in general across the country. When cities start reopening as the pandemic kind of enters a new phase, these worries about rats actually don't go away. They just change a bit. So we get Bloomberg, New York City rat complaints surge as urban life revives. The New York Times has run multiple pieces about rat sightings increasing with the advent of things like outdoor dining. There's been a big increase, they report, in sightings of rats and the number of people calling 311 about them. This is the hotline you can ring in New York for problems that are not an emergency. So there were 21,000 calls about rats to 311 compared with just over 12,000 in 2014. There are even a few people who are really into the rise in rats, like this New York Post piece I found titled, Why I Love New York's Massive Rat Infestation, which is by a writer <laughs> who compares himself to the Pied Piper and who also thinks that the rise in rats will keep his rent low. That's a real, did a rat write this kind of mood to that. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the deal here? What do we think is going on? Well, the question I have is, are there really more rats in big cities? Or are people just noticing them more? And do the reasons for this apparent increase hold up? So what does it have to do with the pandemic and the other reasons that come up, like climate change and gentrification? Is there really a link between rat sightings and these phenomena? Or is something more complicated going on? So basically, are rats more out of control now than they were before? Or are we just seeing a sort of media-driven rat panic that is disconnected from the objective <laughs> facts about rat prevalence in our cities. Exactly. Today on the show, we are going to go on a journey both into the rat kingdom and into human psychology. We're going to be looking at some facts about rats and all the other issues that get bundled up with them. I'm Laura Marsh. And I'm Alex Perry. This is The Politics of Everything. Would you like to hear more from TNR? Every day, our writers and editors work to bring you the reporting and analysis you need to make sense of the world. But we can't do it without you. Please consider subscribing to The New Republic with our special offer at tnr.com slash special offer. That's tnr.com slash special offer. Our first guest is Robert Sullivan, the author of Rats, Observations on the History and Habitat of the City's Most Unwanted Inhabitants. So, Robert, we're talking about rats and specifically the notion that in the pandemic rats have proliferated. The idea is there are more rats and they're more emboldened than before. Like there's this new breed of particularly brazen rats. So we want to talk to an expert about all of this. And before we dive in, I wanted to ask you a bit about your background. How long have you been watching rats? I guess I've been watching rats for as long as I've been trying to sort of seriously watch 
I'd say cities. The very first books I wrote were about places that were considered like spoiled or ruined or even devastated. And I started thinking about those kind of places. And eventually you kind of come down to rats. If cities were a theme park run by Disney, then a giant rat that looks nothing like Mickey Mouse would be the kind of theme park character. <laughs> and when you were working on the book and you would go out into the field, what would a typical expedition be like? Well, a typical expedition for the book would be just to go to my alley. I chose an alley that I could mm -hmm. go to repeatedly as if I were a scientist with a kind of controlled experiment. But of course, it wasn't so controlled and it wasn't so much an experiment in the sense of a lab experiment as it was an experiment in seeing. If I return to the alley every night and look for rats, what would I see each time? What would I see new about the alley? What would I see new about what was around the alley? So you have at least 20 years experience with this. We are talking about the rat situation today. And one of the things that came up in our research was this video from March 2020. So right at the beginning of the pandemic in the US. I remember this is the New Orleans video. It's in New Orleans. So it's a street at night in New Orleans. It looks like it sort of might have just rained. There are those little puddles. And this video went viral last year. So. Mm -hmm. I want to have you take a look at this and tell us what we're seeing. Yeah. Rats in the street, they're eating what I'll call stuff that is food <laughs> in the center. And then rats over by the sewer, going in and out of the sewer. Rats running back underneath doors into side spaces, probably where garbage is. What you might call a big rat in the center there, but is actually kind of a standard size rat. And then younger rats around that rat. And here comes a guy walking along. The only guy in the street, too. The only human in sight. Only human. And the rats go away to some extent because they're not big fans of people rats, kind of like people and rats. And of course, what really happened was that video started circulating and everybody was sending around saying, this is what we're all in for. Rats are going to take over the cities. And now people would say that rats have taken over the cities and it's all out of control. But that's what I found really interesting was that. It was after a disaster in New York. People were panicked about rats. And then in this video in New Orleans, it was mm -hmm. of the, the street in the French Quarter where you would ne you know almost never see it empty of people like that. Right. It's already eerie to see the French Quarter empty of people. And right. then to see the rats in there, it raises the question, is the rat activity after a disaster like, is it good for the rats? What do they do after that? How do they adapt when things like that happen to cities? Right. Well, there were some studies about some scientists, some ecologists, biologists did a paper about rat movement, I think in New York City, looking at how rats moved after the shutdown, after the lockdown in March. And they kind of stayed local. They stayed around the restaurants that they would have been around. They stayed where food sources were. They don't travel these huge long distances. There's a guy named Bobby Corrigan who did a paper on exactly how long they travel. He kind of disbanded the sort of subway tunnel myth. But of course, it's exactly as you say. Really, the thing was that they were more evident. You're not seeing a lot more rats. You're seeing a lot fewer people. And we should say that the kind of baseline, if you take New York City, the baseline rat situation is kind of horrendous in the sense that <laughs> if you were coming from another planet and you were visiting and you saw that, oh, this nocturnal creature, the humans bring out their offerings in plastic bags <laughs> every, yeah. every night around <laughs> Every night around they bring dust, out, yeah. <laughs> just when they're getting up and then they, you know, they feed them. And so it's like, there must be some prayer ritual that they do to get the rats going. So did rat populations go up as soon as there was a shutdown? Yes, in some places. But did they also suffer because some rats had to move into other spaces because suddenly their food source wasn't there because the garbage was taken away at a restaurant. So they had to go find food elsewhere, which means the population kind of spreads. None of it's good, but none of it's a new supersized rats. So just to go back to the video, there's only one person in there. There are not a lot of people walking around the street. Is the thing that we're basically seeing when there aren't a lot of people around because, you know, something bad has happened, like there's a lockdown, the rats that are already there will just come out more freely because there aren't people coming by for them to scurry away from. Yeah, I think that's the most useful way to read it. I'm not saying that they shouldn't be doing rat control on that street if there isn't an issue, but I am saying that it's better to read it the way you just said, that we're seeing an absence of humans and we're really seeing where the sewers are, where there might be a sewer leak. We're seeing where garbage is not stored away safely, maybe in an alleyway. But the natural reaction is to circulate rat videos and say, oh my God, they're super rats. They're the biggest rats I've ever seen. We're all going to die. 
I think there was also a panic about rats after 9-11, and there was one after Hurricane Sandy, which you wrote about for the New Republic. Is there any kind of pattern to these fears about rats? Do people get anxious about rats after big disasters, for instance? I mean, there's a sort of seasonal cycle of rat panic. It can be a huge, horrible disaster, or it can be a Taco Bell that's suddenly infiltrated. I think a Walgreens was shut down in San Francisco a couple of days ago or some kind of chain drugstore because of it. There was like a Popeye's in Washington, D.C. that there had a viral rat video. But yeah, you just see yeah. them periodically. Then that'll go up on the nightly TV news on one station and the other station will feel compelled to follow. And then possibly now the way the news hierarchy works, then maybe a newspaper will even do a story. They'll try to do a think piece on the Taco Bell rat problem. <laughs> if there's any seasonal bump of rat sightings in the modern era, say from the 60s on, you can count on a politician jumping on that and sort of like saying that they have the rat plan, which gets you great press because <laughs> everybody wants to hear your rat plan. I think the current mayor of New York had a rat plan in proximity to his campaign. Yeah, that would be Mayor-elect Adams, whose bucket-based rat plan we discussed earlier. What makes rats such a compelling subject for such a wide range of people? Rats live in places that we'd prefer not to think about or <laughs> that we don't see or that we don't want to see. And rats are in sort of places that we'd like to pretend aren't there until we can't pretend anymore. And then we have to blame somebody. And then we have to say, it's this is the problem or that's the problem. And oftentimes we put other issues on top of the rats. And we say, we have to get rid of these things because these are rats. We have to get rid of these people because of the rats. And the 60s is a great report in the Times, in the New York Times, it says, Upper East Side, Fifth Avenue residents attacked by rats from Harlem. Oh, I mean, wow. it's it's a perfect thing, but, yeah. but it's just like today. The Times keeps linking. The New York Times keeps linking to a report that says that gentrification causes rat outbreaks. It's wrong. The science doesn't really show that. Rats are in places in the city that lack investment and resource. When you come in and say, oh, they're building new houses and construction is causing the, well, yeah, sure. A lot of construction workers can leave garbage out. Things don't get picked up. That's definitely a problem. But everybody's screaming about rats in particular areas where there's some gentrification, where there's new people who moved in and reporting the rats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right now, you know, there's a housing project in the Bronx that has, you know, they're streaming rat photos in their kitchens, in their homes, and they're killing rats and they're in the toilets. It was in like late October and they put it in October for pest control, but they're not coming until December or something. Yeah. I mean, everybody's freaking out about this rat or that rat because it's ruining my lifestyle, but it's a, it's a different story where it's really a problem. That is what is so interesting about it, because on the one hand, rats are or can be treated as a sort of almost a moral panic by the media in the sense of using rats as a stand-in for some other concern they have. But then on the other hand, they're very straightforwardly a story about government investment and competence. They're animals that we have been sharing cities with for a very long time right. that are there. We panic when they come out in the open and we see them, but they're not like a sort of result of a moral failing. They're just a result of bad sanitation, basically. Right. The simplest things are what makes cities so great and wonderful, too, uh, is the flip side of that. Being connected and knowing your neighborhood and, and investment in community means that somebody says on day one, I think you have a rat problem or we have a rat problem. That's, mm -hmm. really, that's really the answer. It's not like you are causing the rats. It's we have a rat problem. I want to talk about the current rat problems and how we, if New York had a rat problem, how we would measure that. One of the articles that kind of prompted us to start thinking about rats was this piece in the New York Times with the headline, NYC rats, they're in the park, on your block, and even at your table. And this piece describes a great leap in sightings of rats. But when you read it, all the places that rats have been seen are actually outdoors. So it's like we saw a rat in the street, saw a rat in the park, and someone who saw a rat on the table, it was outdoor dining. So these are all rats that haven't sort of entered human spaces. They haven't gone inside the home. Right. If New York had a rat problem, how would you measure that? How do we typically gauge how many rats there are? It's a great analysis of that piece. And really what it comes down to is news. Rats are exactly where they were 
before you read this article. <laughs> they're just like the same. So it's really upsetting about the whole outdoor dining thing. Oh no, there are rats now, there's outdoor dining. First of all, there was never any outdoor dining in, in the Bronx, in sections of the Bronx, which now have outdoor dining, which is a great thing. And probably mm -hmm. the sort of positives of people in community seeing each other, eating and enjoying the socialness of that is probably outweighing the problems with rats. So there was a rat problem before this all happened. You know, NYCHA I mean, New York City Housing has some real rat problems. We've had them the whole time and they're happening mostly in the disinvested neighborhoods. Is there something people commonly believe or commonly repeat about rats that is basically a myth that there's no evidence for? What do people think they know about rats that might not actually be true? The sort of baseline rat fact is that there's a one rat per person. That is a statistic that just so, you know, in New York City, yeah, in New York City, it's like it's your soulmate out there. Just you're waiting <laughs> to be reunited with the rat for you. <laughs> yes, exactly. That statistic is out there. It came from a survey that was done, I think, in the teens in England. They were looking at rats all around the countryside in England because farming was the big rat problem as it as it is for us today. So the guy did some calculations, this naturalist back in England, and he kind of estimated of total acres of England. And it kind of came out to one rat per person over the whole of England, <laughs> something like that. It didn't match everywhere. And he was doing it in a particular instance at a particular moment. But that is just too juicy. It's too excellent. It's like Taco Bell food to a rat. It's like, you know, <laughs> chicken, frankly, fried chicken to a rat. So then in 1949, there's a guy named Dave Davis, who's a kind of founder of urban ecology. He's in Baltimore. So Davis does his studies there, then comes to New York to trap rats and comes up with a statistic. Basically, it's like 250,000 rats is the number he comes up with back then, or about one for every 36 people, I think it was. Mm -hmm. So then that number goes into New York database. Like the city uses that number for a year or two, but then the pressure of the one-to-one -one is too much. It's unbearable. The UN is using the one-to-one -one thing again. The number is just too good. People can't let go of it. They like the stat too much. It's too good. There's a great piece that everybody knows about, I'm sure, in The New Yorker by Joseph Mitchell in 1949. He quotes the one-to-one -one thing. I think that's a few years after it's been sort of discounted. And he was famously not exactly stringent with his facts. And then I remember when I published a piece about it, I published part of the Rats book in the New York Times Magazine, and I sort of debunked this number. Uh, and it was, you know, fact check and they checked my debunking i was it was bunked or whatever <laughs> and then sure enough like two weeks later a letter to the editor came in the times and said that i was wrong that it's there's really one rat per person in new york and everybody knows it so i was like <laughs> de debunked it was most excellent well robert thank you so much for talking to us for sharing your decades of knowledge about rats we really appreciate it thank you I don't know that I have decades of knowledge about anything, but you're welcome. <laughs> I have decades. <laughs> Thank you for sharing my decades. Is what you meant. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. When you start looking more closely at rats and looking at the history of rats, what's clear is that our fears of rats are incredibly enduring. On the question of whether the numbers are going up, there's really no clear evidence that they are. But what we do have evidence of is that concerns about rats are being aired more frequently. Well, there's no rat census, right? Like, we don't actually know. <laughs> there, no, one's done a, no one's done a fresh count. They have to travel back to their place of birth every 10 years to <laughs> <laughs> register. <laughs> so after a short break, we'll be back to talk with Liza Featherstone about what's underneath our rat anxiety. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Check them out at betterhelp.com slash tpoe. The best way to think about therapy is through a bunch of analogies. We get our cars tuned up to prevent bigger issues down the road. We do chores regularly to avoid a giant mess of a house. Going to therapy is like all of these. It's routine maintenance for your mental and emotional wellness to prevent bigger issues down the road. Going to therapy doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It means you're investing in yourself to keep your mind healthy. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Why invest in everything else and not your mind? This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and the Politics of Everything listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com tpoe. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P. 
com slash tpoe. Right now, the Supreme Court is hearing major cases on abortion rights. If Roe v. Wade falls, what next? On a special episode of the New Yorker Radio Hour, Gia Tolentino joins me to look at what's happening in Texas, Mississippi, and across the border in Mexico. And our expert on constitutional law explains some decisions that weaken the foundation of abortion rights from the very start. That's the New Yorker Radio Hour, wherever you listen to podcasts. We're joined now by Liza Featherstone, a regular contributor to TNR, who recently wrote about rats. Liza, have you seen any good rats lately? Have you had a good rat encounter? Oh, I sure have. I live in Brooklyn, and there are a lot of restaurants around the corner for me. And there's also a community garden. So Mm. it's a real like rat superhighway between the community garden and the garbage um, piles that accrue by the restaurants. That's going to be a rat hot spot there. It's a rat uh, (laughs) night spot. I think it's a destination for the big rat parties. Yeah, no, we we see quite a lot um, of rats. So your piece sort of says there is a sort of rat panic. You know, the media worries about rats. You're saying it's not just about rats. What is your argument about what we're what we're worried about when we worry about rats? Yeah, I mean, r- rats are gross, no question. I don't mean to um, minimize that. Their scaly tails kind of offend our sense of what warm-blooded mammals should be like. You know, we sort of, as humans, gravitate toward, like, these nice, fuzzy, mm-hmm. you know, creatures. Right, because squirrels are basically the same animal, but with, like, a fluffy tail. And exactly. everyone is really excited about squirrels. <laughs> love them. Love them. <laughs> yeah, everybody loves squirrels. You know, you'll occasionally, some naysayer will point out that a squirrel is just like a rat, like you just have... Like a tree rat. I am in the habit of saying this, yeah. But it, it's really like a minority view because of the puppy <laughs> tail. Because it's all aesthetics. <laughs> and also, rats are a bit uncanny. We know that they're very intelligent and they're like a little more than maybe a rodent should be. You know, and so there's something kind of like a little creepy about that. But most of all, they feel like invaders. They feel like um, nature in places where nature shouldn't be. They're running around while people are eating in the outdoor dining spaces. They might get into people's homes. They're not in places where people generally want animals to be. So it feels a bit out of control when you see rats. But for all of those reasons, I think rats make a very convenient source of displacement. So when we are anxious about a lot of other things, it's very easy to project those anxieties onto rats. So yeah, there was quite a lot of worry about rats um, this summer, which has recurred again. In the column that I wrote on this, I speculated that there was an element of, of displacement of our fears about climate change in, in the obsession of, around rats, because at the same time that every major New York newspaper was covering the rat issue, <laughs> people in China, in major Chinese cities, were having to be rescued from flooded tunnels. People were dying in Germany um, from climate change caused floods. It really seemed as though nature was unraveling globally, like the the rats were sort of a smaller, more manageable projection uh, for us. They're a more psychologically manageable symbol of us not being in control of the environment than these images of disaster that you're talking about. That's right. And that's what, I mean, Sigmund Freud and his daughter, Anna Freud, in their theory of displacement, that's precisely how they identified it. When we are faced with incredibly large, overwhelming anxieties, we will often focus on something smaller and more manageable. So as disgusting as rats are, genuinely, I don't like rats either. It's really not that serious. I mean, we could go on living in New York City among rats, (laughs) and we have been for a long time. Yeah. But that's what's so interesting. We've been living alongside them for years and years and years. But it's interesting, too, because when you go through the archives, go back and look at rat stories, and they pop up at times of unrelated crises. You know, there were rat stories around Hurricane Sandy. 
You know, there were rat stories around 9-11. There were rat stories around the fiscal crisis. The rats don't go away in between the crises. They're there the whole time. But then we suddenly notice them again at these times of much larger concern. That's right. That's a wonderful finding and not a surprising one. The question I have, too, is that when people are talking about sightings going up, and in these recent New York Times pieces, they say the number of people calling 311 is going up. Is that because there are more rats or are people just more aware of it when you're walking around your neighborhood just after a lockdown and like everyone's wearing masks and you're feeling really vulnerable and and kind of jumpy maybe? I mean, some people weren't, some people were. And you see a rat, then maybe you're more scared of it or more uncomfortable about it than you would be. Because when I think about my rat experiences in 10 years of living in New York, they're pretty evenly distributed, you know, like <laughs> yeah. in the good times and in the bad times. Like rats live here and I live here. Anecdotally, I feel like it's not like there are more rat sightings, but maybe people who are seeing these rats are like freaking out more because it's like another sign that this is like another bad thing. Like we had Trump, we have a pandemic. <laughs> and now I have to like look at this rat cross my path on the street outdoors where it lives. That's outrageous. I need to phone 311 and call this in. <laughs> Get someone to come and arrest this rat. It is funny, the 311 calls about rats. It's like, what does 311 do? Like, they don't have like a squad that comes out. <laughs> They're just like, okay, we have noted your complaint. If we will yeah. collect this data. Yeah, maybe some active listening. It sounds like you're <laughs> having some feelings <laughs> about the rats. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in the early 2000s, I lived on the Upper West Side and there was a bar that we used to go to called Saints, which was a lovely gay bar, which is no longer around. And the the block that in back of it, we used to call it Rat Alley because there were always rats on this particular block. And I remember one time walking um, with open-toed shoes and, um, <laughs> and uh, like, having a very unpleasant near encounter. I feel the same as you, Laura, that one sees rats in New York City at all different times. But there's no question that there are more right now. I mean, the outdoor dining sheds are are creating their own rat attractions. I don't know if the rat population has increased, but... Rat inter... Maybe human rat interaction. Exactly. Human mm -hmm. rat interaction, which is something that we generally want to keep at a minimum, has increased. <laughs> <laughs> There's no question about that. Rats do, though, make such an effective displacement of larger concerns to the um, degree that Freud even had a patient that he referred to in his writings called Rat Man, because the man had such overwhelming sexual anxieties, but displaced them in fears that rats were, you know, going to nibble over his body when he was asleep and these sort of lurid <laughs> worries about rats. And so in some sense, we're all rat men right now. We were talking too about your argument that concern about rats or these details that you can see in your own town or city of chaos as a sort of displaced anxiety about climate change. But I was sort of joking, like, that's the left-wing displacement. Like, there's a like, completely separate, like, rats as unclean, uh, like, unclean invaders that is that the sort of, like, right-wing, like, the New, York, the New York Post version of it, where the rats are the stand-in for all these other things that are wrong with the world. I would definitely agree with that. I actually think that even people with right-wing politics have climate anxiety, and they are just in denial about it in different ways. About the source of that anxiety, sure. <laughs> However, I definitely think that we are displacing different things depending on where we are on the political spectrum. And sure, for the New York Post and its readers, they fear that it's the 1970s coming back and that there is all kinds of uh, crime and urban chaos. And then there's sort of concern that is maybe neither left nor right exactly, but a lot of the people complaining about rats are also saying, you know, there are all these people in our neighborhood we don't recognize, and the rats make a, a convenient screen mm -hmm. for those concerns. That's a lot to put on the shoulder of a, of a poor little rat. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know. But they are um, really smart little <laughs> well, one thing I'm curious about, right, is so we have all these problems and rats are gross, and we've talked about that a lot. 
But it also strikes me that we kind of love rats. I mean, we've been, I, we were really excited to do this episode. Every single person I've mentioned it to is like so eager to volunteer their greatest rat story to me. I mean, what would Freud make of that? Oh, yeah. And want to read about them and talk about them. Yeah. I think part of what's weird about rats is there is a sort of respect that we have for them. <laughs> They've got a lot of moxie in the way that they are just <laughs> obvious survivors. And we're all out here trying to survive New York City and, yeah. and, um, and you know, a complicated historical moment as well. And, you know, there was a wonderful video. It was a TikTok. I'm sure you guys saw it about of all the flooding in the subway. The last shot was a swimming rat. He was just literally swimming. And the whole TikTok was was wonderful, but you know that the reason it went viral was for that last shot of the freestyling rat. Yeah. Because you know, he's just exemplified the way everybody was just trying to get through this storm. And there was kind of an <laughs> identification with him until recently. And that sort of changed with the pandemic, which is another story. We didn't see many animals in New York City. So we're a little bit um, alienated from mm. uh, animals which we generally like. From the animal kingdom, yeah, exactly. It's rats or pigeons, right? Yeah. Those are the two choices that you have if you live in New York <laughs> and you want to see animals. Exactly. It's a love-hate relationship in a way. We have a kind of respect for them as fellow urban survivors. I feel like like because we're like inextricably linked to rats, they follow us around, they follow civilization around. That's right. Human civilization equals rats. Yeah, and I, I feel like we have this sort of movie villain relationship with them where we're thinking we're a lot more alike than you think, you know? <laughs> like we're not yeah. we're not so dissimilar. <laughs> and we find that sort of I think we you know, that's it's, that's both repelling and kind of fascinating. Because they're like you said, they're they're smart and and their survivors. And that's another element of the uncanny, is the unexpectedly humanoid aspects. <laughs> Eliza, thank you so much for talking to us today. Thanks so much for having me. We've talked a lot about the problem with rats. And what's clear is rats aren't going away. There's actually only one place in the world that I'm aware of that has a zero rat policy. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but this map goes viral every now and then, and it's like rat population worldwide. And there's this pocket, one pocket, where humans live and rats do not. And it's Alberta, Canada, which has had a sort of zero-tolerance rat eradication policy since the 1950s. It doesn't surprise me that this would be this would be in Canada, a well-run <laughs> country. The rest of us have to live with rats, but we don't necessarily have to live with these rat panics. So I want to close this episode by taking us back to a simpler time. I'm going to send you a link to a video. So let me know when you've got that. Oh, uh, it's Pizza Rat. There he <laughs> is. There is Pizza Rat. Pizza Rat is carrying a uh, entire slice of pizza down the stairs in a New York City subway station. The title on this video, which I never really registered how funny it is, is New York City Rat Taking Pizza Home on the Subway. It is a whole slice of pizza as if he went to a dollar slice store and like paid <laughs> right. his dollar for this slice of pizza. <laughs> I think that's one, I mean, one reason that I believe this, it went so viral and was so beloved was that the slice of pizza is the size of the rat. <laughs> like, yeah, it's cute because it's like the same size. You're happy he has so much. It's like when you see an ant carrying a leaf and you just admire nature because animals can do these things. <laughs> So what do you remember about like the national mood at the moment that this video came out? Well, it's funny. Pizza Rat came out in 2015. We were talking about videos in which you identify with the rat. And I think the difference between 2015 and now in the national mood or maybe the international mood is that in 2015, we were delighted and identified with this little rat carrying a slice of pizza home on the subway, perhaps home from his stable <laughs> job in journalism or something like that. And now the rat we identify with is the one struggling to stay afloat in the flooded subway tunnel. I think that is suggestive of how things have gone since the tail end of Barack Obama's second term. Yeah, I mean, when I watch this video, I have nostalgia, not just for this lovely little rat with its pizza, but also for the moment that that video is from. And it does seem like a sort of a general rule, the less anxiety there is across the board, the happier people are with little rats and you know seeing something scurry in front of their path as they go down the subway steps. Like maybe it doesn't seem like such a big deal. 
I think that's really important, though. If you see a rat and interpret it as a sign of chaos and decline, that's probably not because of the rat. That's probably because of other things going on in the world. <laughs> I'm still not pro-rat. Rats are a problem. They have to be kept under control and so on. But they also are not like an <laughs> omen of doom. We should be clear. This is not, this is not a pro-rat infestation program. We just don't think you should blame your broader apocalyptic feelings. Don't blame the humble rat for that. The Politics of Everything is co-produced by TalkHouse. Emily Cook is our executive producer. Melissa Kaplan is our audio editor. If you enjoy the show and want to support it, please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Every review helps. Thanks for listening.